The allegations have shocked many. A teenaged boy locked in an 8x8 box inside the garage in a neighborhood filled with million dollar homes. Inside that box, no windows, a mattress on the floor, a desk, a bucket used as a toilet, and a camera recording everything. What was going on inside this house? Prosecutors say it was child abuse. Timothy Ferreter and his wife Tracy torturing their adopted son while the rest of the family enjoyed the good life in Jupiter, Florida. But Timothy Ferreter had a different explanation. His son was dangerous and doctors and therapists weren't helping them and he feared for the safety of his younger children. The jury heard all the evidence, listened to the arguments, and then convicted Timothy Ferreter of aggravated child abuse. Today, he was back in court for judgment day as the judge decided just how much time Timothy Ferreter will be locked inside a box inside a state prison. Tonight, we are live from the courthouse as we continue our investigation into what happened to the boy in the box. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. And this story, this case, this trial really boils down to one thing. He locked his son in a box. I mean, that's all you have to say. That's all you have to say. And then you see a picture of it. Like, was there, was there any other level of, of what this was about, this whole case? And that headline, as straightforward as it is, um, became the basis for everything that happened inside the courtroom as we went through and trying to figure out what exactly was going on in this situation and, and the big question of why. Why? Was there some sort of reasonable explanation that would resonate, that would excuse and explain locking your son in a box in the garage. Well, there wasn't. There wasn't. And, and for Timothy Farrader, uh, the jury convicted him. Now, today was his sentencing day, but before sentencing day and after the verdict, he was locked up in jail, put in a box in jail. And let me tell you, I've seen a lot of defendants through the years, right? They, they, they um, go to trial, they lose, they come back for sentencing, and, you know, you don't see that much of a difference. This was absolutely drastic. This guy's having a rough time, rough time in jail, and you could see it in his face. That seeming confidence that he had during the trial was gone. This was a man who was shaken and stirred, and whatever's happening uh, behind bars is not good. It, it's, it's just not for him, but that's your punishment. You commit a crime, you get punished. And, and that's, that was part of it, that was waiting to, before today to find out what was gonna happen. Now, the case isn't over, because Timothy Farrard is married, and his wife Tracy is up next. So the question with Tracy Farrard is, is it the same exact story? Is it the same exact situation? Will a second jury look at this differently? Will there be, will they distinguish between mom and dad and their role inside that household in determining what happened to this child? That's a big unanswered question. And of course, we'll continue to follow her story, her case, but tonight we'll take a closer look at Tracy Ferreter during this program. But for now, as we begin, the, the real question, and I want you to think about this um, during the course of this entire hour, because we're going to dive into what happened to that boy in the box. Was justice served here? Was, was justice served in, in what the judge ordered today for Timothy Farrader and what may happen to Tracy Farrader as well? What has happened to the, the victim in this case, that boy? Is, is, is this justice? Now, I think everyone agrees this was a, a tragic situation. It was unfortunate. It was absolutely 1,000%, I believe, preventable, but would have required the Farragers to reach out and continue to reach out. But they did what they did. He was convicted, 
And today he was sentenced. A lot of leeway for this judge to go one way or the other, to go, you know, less than five years to up to 40 years. That's a big difference. That's a big difference. You know, the guilt phase of the trial was important, but this was just as important. Because the question is, you know, how long is Timothy Ferrer going to be punished for this? What else will the judge do in handing down a sentence? And, and from my perspective, sentencing day is judgment day. Let's take a look. It is not lost on the court of, that not only is the defendant here going to be the one to suffer the, the weight of the sentence that I impose, but the entire family has already suffered the trauma and the ramifications and consequences of the defendant's conduct. Um, and on that issue, I do think that the defendant exercised and expressed his um, remorse at that. Um, I just wish he'd have been a little more um, uh, forceful in getting the point to me that he actually acknowledges that what he did was wrong, and I didn't get that. I still didn't get that because I have some sneaking feeling that if uh, all things being equal, uh, the defendant might say that he would do the same thing over again because he thought it was the right thing to do out of love at the time he did it, and that creates problems for me. I hope that I'm wrong on that, but at least that, that, that doubt, that doubt has been allowed to remain in my head. So... All right, so enough said on this. Uh, I am going to um, exercise my discretion to downward depart here. I'm going to, but uh, I, I will tell you that um, the downward departure is not even remotely close to what the victim has requested nor the defense counsel requested. Um, and at the end of the day, the sentence um, that I'm going to impose is going to be longer than what the guidelines provide. I'm going to downward depart from 75 months to 60 months. And followed by five years of probation, two years of pro uh, the first two years of probation of which will be uh, in CC2. During the term of probation, the defendant is not to have any um, contact initiated with any of the three older children. Uh, those children will be free once they reach age of majority to have contact with um, the defendant if they so choose. In any event, even if the children so choose to have contact with the um, uh, defendant, they will not be able to do so until the defendant has first completed the following conditions of probation. Uh, I'm going to require that the defendant undergo a 40-hour anger management um, class, which can be taken while he is in custody, uh, that he undergo a 40-hour parenting course, and that he also undergo a mental health evaluation. All right, a couple things here. One. The judge pointing out that he didn't say what he did was wrong. That's called accepting responsibility. That's a huge part in sentencing for someone to get a lighter sentence, to accept responsibility for what you did. That's why people who enter plea agreements get lesser sentences, because they are accepting responsibility for their actions. The judge did not believe that this defendant did that. That's a problem. But the downward departure, those are unusual. There are certain guidelines that judges have in, in, in this state and in other states and in the federal system. This is the range that you should, but you can go outside this range if you find reasons why you should upward departure, give him more time, or downward departure where you get a little less time. And here he got less, down to five years. Then the other part of this um, sentence, which is significant, are the conditions of probation. A judge can basically put almost anything as a condition of probation because he's giving you or she's giving you probation instead of incarceration. So one of those conditions is really, it's over with him and his other kids. It's over, like until they're adults. There's not gonna be any contact because it's at least 10 years. Because it's five years he's locked up then five years of probation, wow. That's a big part of this. But, I mean, you look at the nature of the offense. It was his parenting skills. But now this family is, pfft, that's it. These kids are going to be raised by someone else. And what happens afterwards, who knows? Um, big, big day down there. Let's bring in Court TV legal correspondent Julie Janae, who was inside the courtroom today. Um, she has her takeaways, as always. But I want to begin um, with some of the reaction and those moments inside the courtroom. What was the the tone, what was the mood like, and what was the reaction to the sentenced?
that was handed down by the judge. Vinny, it was an emotional day inside of this courtroom. There were gut-wrenching moments. But what made this trial unique is that sitting in the gallery where you had supporters and family members of Tim Ferreter and his son, RF, along with people who had been involved in his care since he's been removed from the custody of his father on the other side, there's almost this blurred line of where the emotions were flowing from and towards whom. Uh, we saw the tears when... Timothy Ferreter was speaking from his family. We also saw tears from his son when his father was speaking to him. There were tense moments, especially when these issues of who he can speak to in terms of his children came up. That seemed to be a point that he really wanted to emphasize, wanted to get his attorney to make sure that he would be able to contact his children. Three of them are teenagers, so they will reach the age of majority, 18, in a handful of years. But he has a younger son that's been adopted by his wife's mother. And there was a question of whether or not he'd be able to have contact with him. The judge saying no contact contact unless it's supervised so he will be able to have supervised interaction with that younger son uh, but he will not have any say in the discipline of that child so really hard day all around for everyone there in the courtroom absolutely this was this was this was a tough case but again it gets back to that headline he locked his son in a box and i don't think anyone can get over that or beyond that or really comprehend or understand that so as you always do, Julie Janae, you're there on the ground, and, and for folks coming home tonight, you can sort of dissect the day and present to us three of the big, big moments aside from the judge handing down the sentence. What do you have for us first? The biggest moment, Vinny, was Timothy Ferreter speaking in court. We haven't heard him share his side from his own voice. He's had his attorney speaking on his behalf. He didn't speak at his trial. So there was a question of whether or not he was going to say anything to the judge today and speak. He did. Uh, the audio wasn't great in terms of the microphone that he used. But inside the courtroom, we could hear him clearly. And his words were strong and there was a level of care in them. He spoke directly to each member of his family, each child by name gave them almost this this goodbye message and that's when I was seeing that emotion from his family members emotion from his wife sitting behind him that he addressed as well here was his message to his son Mom, I love you your mama loves you we're all very sorry for everything everything you have gone through and everything you continue to go through I am empathetic to where you are placed now. I did all that I could to help you avoid that. As your father, I wish I could be by your side now and stand strong with you. I thank you, Lana, for your honesty and courage when you spoke of mercy a few weeks back. Lana, you were my first boy. There were times when Timothy Ferreter broke down. He had to stop himself when he spoke about his kids. So he really shared this father's love to the court. And you wonder how that may have gone come across to a jury if he had been able to speak in the way he did today. But uh, Vinny, as I mentioned, his son was there with people who had their arms around him, arms on his back while they were, he was listening. And there were times he looked down on the ground, had his entire body uh, keeled over. But then there were other times that I saw him just taking off his glasses and wiping away tears. So there were just poignant moments throughout this sentencing. Julia, I think you're right on here because at the trial, I remember as we're watching this and he, he didn't take the stand and he didn't speak, he didn't humanize himself. He was like this, this monster that was described and we heard the recordings and we saw this video of him putting the camera in the box. I mean, all of this... To me, there was no sense of, well, where's the love? Where, where is his humanity? Where is his fatherhood? That's, that's what we, I think the jury would have needed to hear and understand to try to understand his explanation, but it didn't happen. Okay, that's the first big takeaway. What's your second? 
Uh, well, after all of that, after hearing Tim Ferrader speak on his own behalf, we then turn to the state who is able to present their evidence in front of this judge to ask for 15 years was the number that the prosecution wanted. And they called RF, the juvenile victim, to the stand. We were so curious as to what he would say now that he's heard his father. He had a written statement. Here's a portion from that. My father was a good person. We just really made a really serious mistake. He was not a bad parent. He worked in the medical field when I was a young age. We went, we went all went on, went on to out of country vacations, such as Canada and France. He had a lot of friends. He had a positive impact on those around him. But we got to remember that a mistake was made, and trauma lasts. I still love you, and I will continue to love you for the rest of my days. But how do I feel about you? I feel sad, I feel sympathy, I feel hope. But most importantly, I feel forgiveness. Other people may not think that, but I do. In that I hope you can gather yourself and try to follow up on the consequences of your actions. Just remember that I'm still, still your son, no, no matter what. And always remember that I'm still a ferreter. And Judge Co Coates, I wish you could sentence my beloved father, Tim, six months jail time, five years probation. And I have and true mercy is not just from the heart. It's the will of the victim to accept mercy that he has received for his wrongdoings. This was such a heavy moment inside of that courtroom. Vinny, I was seeing a different father and son than I saw during that child abuse trial where a jury was present. RF was different on the stand. He was emotional. He, during the trial, was very stoic. He laughed at times, but didn't show really any kind of crying or tears. And today, it was a completely different son and a different Timothy Ferreter. When his son was on the stand during the trial, he did not break the look in his face, which was just straightforward. And I think the judge learned something about Timothy Ferreter today in that he mentioned in his statement that he was raised on a Marine base. Judge Coates served in the Marines back in the 70s and 80s, and he seemed to have a connection with him, understanding now that he may have been raised in a very strict military home. He mentioned the judge did Quantico and how he can imagine what that must have been like. So the sentencing was just so different from the trial. And I think we got closer to the truth today than we did at the trial. And to me, that's a shame because a, a jury should judge a case. And I'm not saying the jury got it wrong or they would have done something differently, but I always want the jury to have the real picture. And the way you're describing it is so true. I've never heard a moment like we just heard right there. And that's, I think, what the jury should have had in trying to figure out what was going on here. And I'm not saying they would have gotten it differently or wrong, but at least it would have been based more on the reality. I felt like this was reality today. And, and a lot of it has to do with, and we always say, criminal defendants don't have to testify, but in a situation like this, which is about a parent-child relationship, and the child's not a, a, a little person who can't speak up for himself, this is a child who's incredibly articulate. And to see that and experience that, to me, I'm with you, Julia, 10,000%. This was, this, this, today was really getting to, to what happened and, and what this relationship was. Amazing. Okay, you have another takeaway from today for us. I do. And just think about these moments that we've seen, a father apologizing, the son saying, I forgive my father. So you almost wonder, what can the state do? What are they going to bring after they've had the victim on the stand asking for six months for his father behind bars? Then the prosecutor, Brianna Coakley, read letters from both of the sisters, and we're going to play one. But this is also something that we didn't hear the extent of at trial. These sisters only focused on what they saw with their brother during the 
month, two month period that's at issue in this trial. Here's the same sister that testified speaking about her experience with her father inside of that home. I wanted to share the impact of my brother's abuse on him, my sister Nola, and my other brother Pierce. Consider what it is like to have lived in a house where you can hear the screams of your younger brother when he is not in his room. Screams of frustration, hurt, anger, fear, helplessness, and despair. Where you can hear your father yell profanities at him. Where I could hear my father beat him to the point where my brother was no longer screaming, but crying out in pain and barely able to answer questions. I thought it was over after I heard my dad slam the door shut and storm up the stairs. But no, it was just the continuation of a cycle I knew would start again. That happened too many times to count. It was the same thing. It became a routine. And I couldn't do a thing to stop it. All I could do was hope the storm blew over and that no one else would be targeted. Nola, Ronan, and I all played the game of hot potato with a bomb that could explode at any moment. Who was going to face Tim's angry tone next? Was he going to rage? Would he slam the door? Would he shout? Or was he going to stuff his anger down his throat and plaster a smile on his face and let us off with a warning? No one dared push him past his limit. We didn't want to be the next person locked in our room or restricted from leaving the house. And that letter went on and on for pages. And there was another younger sister, the biological daughter of the Ferreters, who echoed this fear she felt inside of the home, how things had changed, how uh, one sister ran away one night, even during the time that RF was missing and police were looking for him. So, Vinny, you're just left almost with a confusion about where the emotions lie in this case because when you have these sisters saying that no, this was not as glossy as our parents are saying. This wasn't just discipline, this went further. So this just underscores the complexity of domestic cases, family law cases, child abuse cases, and these family members having to lay it all bare here in the courtroom. And, and more truth, right? More truth that, that, again, this whole thing was about what was happening inside that home. And I know we've got rules of evidence and we've got limitations, et cetera in our criminal system, but sometimes it, it, it puts a jury in a position where they don't see the whole thing, for better or for worse. Their job is to figure out the truth, but sometimes I think we shield them a little too much. And I think that happened in this case. You know, stuff from both sides, from both sides. Let me just, a quick follow-up, we're out of time here, Julia, but did any other child report being abused? No child reported to authorities that they were abused. They were all questioned after RF was located when he went missing and they shared the abuse that they witnessed from him. And we heard today about uh, their fear and the yelling and things of that nature, but no physical abuse for sure that these other children reported. That's interesting. And I understand the fear. This was a volatile situation, obviously. And, and what was going on in that house? Um, wow. Julie Janae, what a day. Uh, down there and and great reporting great to see you tonight thank you so so much thanks Benny when we come back we're gonna talk about Tracy Ferreter remember she's got charges as well same charges coming up against her what's her case gonna look like we'll take a look plus coming up next hour <laughs> In Austin, Texas, Caitlin Armstrong has been accused of murdering her love rival, Mariah Mo Wilson, and then fleeing the country with her yoga mat. Now all the evidence is in and the arguments have been made, and it's time to hear from the jury. The state of Texas versus Caitlin Armstrong, verdict of the jury. We, the jury, find the defendant, Caitlin Armstrong. I've worked hard all my life. I've gone from being a local reporter to becoming a law student to then even going on to teach other lawyers all before I came to Court TV. As a journalist, lawyer, and teacher, I learned the secret to success is speaking in your authentic voice. And I bring that lesson to my show, Opening Statements, every morning on Court TV. Opening Statements with Julie Grant. Weekday mornings at 8, 7 central, only on Court TV. Oh, here we go, back to this where you can't talk, 
like you're a middle school boy, you want to do all these things, you want to do chess, you want to do things, but you can't talk because you got caught being dishonest. Okay, well, that's fine. I guess I'll just keep giving you more chances every day. A new chance for even though he doesn't care, he doesn't want to be nice to anyone. Well, let's let do this. Oh, let's let me bring some food because I think he's gonna have a good night. Oh, let me do everything for Okay. Oh, can't talk because he got in trouble because he got caught. It's like, give me a break. Start owning up to what you're doing and then try to fix the problem like we keep telling you. That's Tracy Ferreter speaking with her son. She's going to be tried as well for the child abuse. Her husband's been convicted. He's got five years, five years of probation. So what's going to happen with her? And is there a difference in the dynamic of a mother versus a father? Does she have to get on the witness stand to explain what's happening inside that house? To explain to the jury how you got to the point that you built you had a box built in the garage for him to be locked inside with the lock on the outside. So once he's in the box, he doesn't get out unless you let him out. Let's talk about it. Let's bring in our guest joining me in Orlando, Florida, psychotherapist, CEO of Life Counseling Solutions, Dr. Janie Lacey is with us. And in West Palm Beach, Florida, criminal defense attorney and the president of the Martin County Bar Association, Wayne Richter back with us. Great to see you both. Dr. Janie Lacey, let's talk about the dynamics, mom versus dad. Um, what we saw today during uh, sentencing was the first time I saw Timothy Farrader as a human being uh, to a certain extent, right? He didn't testify in his case. What do you think about the dynamics between the two? And how does, how can a, a mother, um, is she, are they partners in this? Do you see them as partners? In, in the treatment and the raising of this son and the building of a box? Well, you'll see when we consider the family dynamic, Vinny, when you have a mom and a dad, there's a certain level of partnership that comes into play when it comes to parenting. And a mom and dad usually have different things that they bring to the table when as far as it comes to parenting. Traditionally speaking, fathers can be more of the logical, more of the task oriented, where moms are more of the, the caretakers, the nurturers, they're a little bit more emotionally in tune to what their children needs. And together from a healthy standpoint, that makes a great team. So when we look on the other side, when we look at abusive family structures, there's also a certain level of collaboration and a certain level of co-signing. So mom or Tracy in this case has to be in a place where we actually hear her co-signing and collaborating, but her treatment is a little bit different because of the dynamic of her being the mother in this situation. So there is a level of responsibility when you look at them both parenting and both co-signing and collaborating as far as the discipline of the children. Because when we look at families just from a therapeutic counseling standpoint, if a mom is disagreeing, which is sometimes what we'll see with the harshness or the way that the dad is parenting, she voices that concern and she intervenes on the side of the child because she's more empathetic or more nurturing and more emotionally in tune. But what we've heard from these tapes, that has not been the case. It's She's been collaborating and co-signing to what Tim has been doing. Yeah, a little problematic. So Wayne, and, and I, was, I said this during the original trial for Timothy Farrell, but for Tracy, uh, is, are they going to learn something here that when you have built a box in your garage and locked your child in it and you're pleading not guilty, you need to come inside the courtroom and explain to the jury whatever you were going through, the, the, the chaos, the desperation, and also show this jury that somewhere within you, you are a loving parent because they didn't see that from Timothy Farrader. No, and I, I, you know, I was thinking about this, why... Um, while we were listening to the first segment, I think a jury potentially is going to hold her to a higher standard than they did Timothy Ferreter uh, for the reasons that were just mentioned. She's the mom. She's the one who's supposed to pr uh, provide protection and security. 
I know stereotypically sometimes the father seen as the disciplinarian in the family. And uh, I think she's going to be in a difficult position because the jury's not going to understand why you didn't step up and say, Tim, this has gone too far. Well, let's take a listen. This is Tracy and Tim Farrader. This is a video, ring video, that the jury gets to see. We don't get to see it on television because there's a minor involved, but we do get to hear it. Let's take a listen. Can I tell me something? Mm -hmm. Tell me what? This is your one chance. Don't look at me like a Can I tell me something or not? Okay, Dr. Jane Lacey, what are you hearing there in the dynamic of uh, Tracy and Timothy Farrader in, in this moment with uh, their son? All right, I'm hearing that threatening. I'm hearing him being humiliated. I'm hearing this aggression in the parenting style. And there's nothing in there that is what we would consider on the healthy spectrum, right? We hear the emotionality in the voice. We understand that parents get frustrated and that parents can emote sometimes their frustration. But the way that I was hearing this clip is that this has probably been the norm and probably even more on the tamer side of what we understand these family dynamics um, to be. But to be at this place of this uh, threatening and these statements that were um, pretty much just hurtful and the way that their son is interacting, when we look at it from a counseling's perspective, he's probably, the way that we're hearing this, the reaction from the son is that this has probably been the norm of how they've been interacting with him. So it becomes their familiar and their baseline in this family structure. Okay, Wayne, so Timothy Farrer was offered a deal, but it was predicated upon him providing information against Tracy. He declined to do that. It was a 24 month deal. Tracy uh, and, and Julie, uh, Julie Janae spoke with the, the prosecutor. Tracy never got an offer. They were waiting to see what happened with Timothy's trial. So two questions to you tonight, Wayne. Um, should she get a plea offer? And if so, what should it be? And then the second question, will she actually get one? I think she's in a real predicament because the state now knows that they can get a conviction against her. So there's not going to be a lot of incentive for the state to offer her a plea offer. That said, the prosecutors on this case, I know both of them, I think they're fair. I think they're reasonable. I think they will make her an offer to not have to go through this uh, experience again for all the parties involved. Uh, but I, I, it wouldn't surprise me if it's higher than the two years that was originally offered uh, to Tim based on the fact that they've already uh, achieved a conviction in one case. Wayne Richter, always great to get your insight. Thank you so much, my friend. Uh, Dr. Jane Lacey, I think you're staying. Let me see. Are you staying with us? No, nope, I'm saying goodbye to you, too. Okay, Dr. Jane Lacey, great to see you as well. I will see you again really soon. A great, great insight for us. All right, folks, when we come back, we'll talk about reactive attachment disorder what the victim was suffering from here, and what does it mean? It, it became part of the sentencing hearing today. A guest of this show was called by the defense. Plus, I've got amazing news for all our Core TV fans. You can now watch full episodes of this show, Closing Arguments with Vinnie Politan, and Opening Statements with Julie Grant, on demand for free at CoreTV.com. Just hit the Shows tab, select Closing Arguments, Put up your feet, enjoy all our content. If your DVR doesn't record us, 
Now we record it for you. We'll be back. I've worked hard all my life. I've gone from being a local reporter to becoming a law student to then even going on to teach other lawyers all before I came to Court TV. As a journalist, lawyer, and teacher, I learned the secret to success is speaking in your authentic voice. And I bring that lesson to my show, Opening Statements, every morning on Court TV. Opening Statements with Julie Grant. Weekday mornings at 8, 7 central, only on Court TV. went to different counselors or the therapist were you getting accurate like good treatment for your child I think one of the problems is that parents don't have a way to judge that because we're not experts right so I think one of the issues is that when parents have a child who has these types of problems you know something is wrong and you know that it's not normal for like a neurotypical child especially like if you're like me and have other children um, who you can kind of gauge that with and so when you do go to get help from a pediatrician or you try to go to a therapist especially if you don't get one who's adoption competent a lot of times um, in my experience um, I did get um, some bad information early on and I think it's one of the issues is it's very hard to know how to even find the right kind of help. Like, I didn't know what to Google to find the right kind of help. I didn't know what the word reactive attachment disorder was. That's Kerry Williams. You may recognize him, you may not, but she's been on this show as a guest when we covered the trial of Timothy Ferreter. Well, today the defense called her as a witness in the case to try to have the judge get a better understanding from a parent's perspective who's, who had a child with reactive attachment disorder so the judge would understand that the ferreters aren't the only ones, this is rare, and how difficult it can be for a parent. That was the purpose. Let's take a listen to more of Kerry Williams' testimony from the sentencing hearing today. The situation got much worse over time because I couldn't find a solution. Um, and it got to the point where there was a violent episode that happened in my home, and that was kind of a trigger for me to have a wake-up call and realize that I could not manage this safely in my home. And so I started uh, going to the mental health ER, and eventually my son was able to go to residential treatment. That did not solve the rat. It didn't cure it. In fact, his condition got worse. But it did create safety for my other children and for my child who was rad. So he was in a variety of these um, different facilities. I was never able to get him into a facility that specialized in rad. I'm, I'm not sure if there is one in my state. I never was able to find one. So these were kind of general um, facilities. And they really were just managing his behavior. They did do manic medication management, and they gave him lots of med no, medication didn't work. Um, and he did, my son was quite violent. And so when he would have violent outbursts, they would restrain him physically or put him in, um, like, a padded seclusion room where they would monitor him. Um, and they would also uh, give them PRNs, which are injections of things to sedate them. And I was very surprised by this. I didn't realize that this is kind of what was standard protocol in facilities. But obviously, since my child has been in 18 of them, it is standard protocol. And it is how they handle, you know, kids who are in violent, having a violent episode. Okay, so this is how she dealt with her son. And it, and it wasn't good. It wasn't pretty. Locked up in a room. And, and my understanding is, is that the victim in this case now is in a situation where he's in inpatient institutionalized to a certain extent trying to deal with um the rad that he has this reactive attachment disorder so let's bring in our experts our guests joining us in new york practicing psychologist and attorney dr gene cirillo back with us and in st louis missouri a mental health and nationally certified clinician specializing in trauma child abuse and neglect sharonda brown also back with us here so what I heard in the sentencing today, which was interesting, uh, Dr. Gene Cirillo, from the defendant, Timothy Farrader, is that he sort of said in a moment when his son w was, was talking about his situation that he was trying to prevent his son from being locked up in some room, and that's where he is now. Yeah. So... What, what are your thoughts about reactive attachment disorder? You've adopted a child, you've got other children in the house, and you're trying to figure out how to handle all of this safely. 
It's so hard when you have other children because you've got a problem child. It's a very serious disorder. It begins very early in life. Lack of forming good attachments with caregivers. And it's true that he is locked up in a room now, but he's better off in a residential facility. He's better off with his own room. That's what his parents should have given him his own room. And he should have been able to use a toilet. Maybe they there might be times when he would have to be isolated from the rest of the family. But what they were doing was punishing. Now he's getting treatment and there is an important difference. Sharonda Brown, your, your thoughts. And, and, and again, what I heard from Timothy Farrader today as he was speaking was like, this is what we were trying to avoid. And he was like uh, uh, attempting to apologize to his son who now, you know, was getting the treatment, but again, is in isolation to a certain extent, I guess at times. Um, what are your thoughts about parents? It seems like that's the only alternative here is to residential, residential treatment, get them out of the house and see what happens. I disagree that residential treatment is the only option for a lot of these children. I've treated so many children with reactive attachment disorder and what I've found is that collaborative efforts are the best I think there's a lot of education that's required when it comes to teaching the parents what's required with the children, as well as the children, because a lot of the children don't recognize what happens to the brain when they are traumatized, what happens to the brain when they are separated from their biological caregivers and placed into a different home. So there's a lot of collaborative efforts that could have taken place with the right clinician and the right help. My specialty is sexual abuse and trauma, so I am definitely trained in this. And a lot of times I've given parents homework assignments, things to do to help the kids feel closer to them, more intimate with them. And over time, you see that there's trust that's built. With trauma brains, it slows down the impulses and it starts to heighten fear and whatnot. So you wanna make sure that the child feels safe every step of the way. You don't wanna put them in a situation where they have to fear for their life more because you will see the aggression. You will have to restrain them. You will have to take them outside of the home. So you want to make sure that you're repeatedly making them feel safe over and over again, even if it gets frustrating for the parents, which is why there has to be a component for the parents to feel just as safe, just as helpful, and just as supported. And I try to make sure that I do that in my practice with my parents. And Dr. Jean Cyril, how do you do the balance, though, when your other concern is the other one, two, or three children in the home and you don't want the disaster of, oh, my goodness, um, you know, one child's been harmed by another, and now we bring in law enforcement, people are going to, people are going to jail. I think my colleague made a very good point. There has to be collaboration, and that should be done with a combined program. And very often, there's intensive outpatient therapy with the possibility of keeping the child inpatient as needed, working very closely with the family, not only the parents, but the other siblings, anybody who's involved with the treatment, the school if necessary. And it should have been done as early as possible, as soon as this was diagnosed or as soon as they suspected any serious problem, there should have been consultation at a very intense level. We're out of time for tonight, but I, I hope that if anyone is watching that knows someone or is in this situation, uh, follows your, your great, great guidance and advice tonight. Dr. Jean Cirillo, Sharonda Brown, thank you both so much, and we'll see you again soon.